And you've been on the East Coast for a long time now. Yeah, right. Good afternoon and welcome to At Yale Live. I'm Eric Gershon. Today we talk economics with a king of the field, Robert J. Schiller, Sterling Professor of Economics and a winner of the 2013 Nobel Prize in Economics. As always, we'll take some of your questions, submit them via Twitter to at Yale or by email to socialmedia at yale.edu. You can also Facebook us. Bob Schiller, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, you are recently returned from uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, what did you think? Who did you meet? Uh, what was interesting to you? How was the experience? It was a day-long experience for most of a week. I met, I can't even remember all the people I met. It, it's a, like a cocktail party that extends uh, all day. I met the mayor of London, Boris Johnson. I met the CEO of Morgan Stanley, James Gorman. I could go on, lots of people. What were, uh, what were some of the um, most memorable uh, moments for you? Uh, I don't know. The thing that strikes me is the general mood of the event. And what struck me most was how it changed abruptly midweek with the Argentine peso problem. Uh, and the feeling I got is that, wow, this is a big world crisis. Uh, but I think I was talking to too many economists. And when I got back, nobody seemed worried about Argentina, <laughs> not many people. Now, was that young, relatively new uh, Argentinian finance minister there himself, do you know? I don't know. No. Uh, it was like everybody talking about it. I mm -hmm. didn't. I didn't see him, so I don't. Uh, there are lots of heads of state there, but generally, I didn't encounter them. They came with their entourages. You mm -hmm. can see when a big crowd moves through the room, it's the prime minister in the center, and you can't even see him because there's so many people, reporters and the like, following them. Now, did I understand that you uh, you tried on Google Glass while you were there? Yeah. How yeah. was that? Well, it was exciting. You know, I had never even seen them before. And uh, it, it a little trip into the future. I imagine that we'll all be wearing something like that someday. And you can just look up and get information. Uh, it would be, uh, it, it scares me. We talked a lot about the future. And this is something that others have commented on at Davos. Uh, it wasn't so much about, well, it was about Argentina. But beyond that, it was a lot about where are we going with all this new technology? And what kind of world will we have in 20, 30 years? And how will young people today pro prosper in that world? That, that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. You are originally from Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And that reminds me of a story that you told on the day that you won the Nobel Prize uh, just a few months ago. If I, and t correct me if I get any of this wrong, but you called up your brother in <laughs> Michigan, <laughs> yeah. and, you say, and you said, did you hear? And he said, <laughs> Yeah, the Tigers lost. <laughs> That's exactly right. And was he, uh, was he, had he not heard or was he just pulling your leg? He had not heard. Well, I called him up pretty quickly. You know, yeah. I got a call at uh, 6.30 in the morning, and it wasn't long afterwards that I called him. Yeah. So it's entirely plausible that he hadn't seen the news yet. That's, a, that's pretty funny. Um, so you were, you were already a very prominent, uh, globally prominent economist before you won the Nobel Prize. You've since won the Nobel Prize. Uh, has, has the additional um, uh, renown uh, changed your life in any particular way? Well, I hope this is temporary. Uh, I've had to declare email bankruptcy. <laughs> that means I don't feel that I can repay all the debts. When people write me, I should write back, but I just can't. Yeah. Uh, so I'm hoping. The other thing that really strikes me is uh, People come up to me and say, I'm honored to meet you. <laughs> Nobody ever said that to me before. <laughs> it's the prize. For, uh, this is clearly among academic prizes the number one prize. And uh, I, I can feel it. I can really feel the difference. Yeah. Um, has um, has uh, it sparked any new uh, relationships that you expect, um, I don't know, uh, to, to lead to projects you hadn't considered before? Well, I'm getting contact. You know, I'm on somebody's list. <laughs> and so I'm getting... Uh, Probably on a lot of lists. <laughs> yeah, politicians, not just from this country, but around the world, will have, have their aid or someone contact me with... Um, they th well, that's just... Like asking for advice. 
Or maybe they want me as a uh, trumpet for some of their mm -hmm. <laughs> advice. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, I suspect we're going to get a number of, of fairly detailed questions about specific aspects of, of uh, the, e the economy and business in the course of the show. But I want to ask, uh, initially, for your, your big picture view of the economy as we see it right now um, at the beginning of 2014, the bright spots, the concerns, and what's on your mind? Well, uh, I tend to think about the long term, not just about this year. Mm -hmm. And the issue that comes, I, I've already alluded to it, is rising inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, well, I guess there's a social, we had a, s a session at Davos about the world in 50 years. <laughs> I left feeling anxious, <laughs> sweaty palms. <laughs> what is it going to be like? Because we have this problem of rising inequality, largely connected to rising technology, artificial intelligence replacing people. But it's more than that. There's a lot of issues going. The future is just unknown. One thing is global warming, but there may be other environmental catastrophes. I'm sounding very negative here, but I'll try to be positive. This technology is moving fastly, rapidly forward. And it's changing the world for the better so far. I want to see, as an economist, that it stays that way, that it, ex that it doesn't impoverish whole segments of the world uh, or cause nations to decline that uh, you know, ought to hang in there and benefit from the prosperity. Mm -hmm. You're uh, obviously very famous for um, the concept of, of uh, financial bubbles. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit, first define it, because it's, um, it's a term I think a lot of people uh, think they understand or have a notion right. of, but you may have a more specific definition. Um, and then maybe talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the most interesting bubbles that you've studied and what you've found so illustrative about them. Well, the term bubble, if you look it up in the dictionary, it will say something like a uh, speculative bubble is a an instance where prices of some speculative asset are rising rapidly, but for no good reason, like filled with air. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the price rise is filled with air like a bubble. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a good enough definition in, in my case, in my opinion. So I, I wrote my own definition in, in a book I wrote called Irrational Exuberance. And there, we've oh, got it right there. <laughs> I could read it from that, but I won't. Paraphrasing my own definition, I think the es essential idea within the bubble is feedback. That is, prices go up, and it feeds back into investor demand. And they, uh, then they see prices going up, and expecting them to go up further, they buy into the market and push prices up again. And then this repeats itself in an upward cycle. But I have to go on beyond that, because in order to understand what a bubble really is, it's also a psychological phenomenon that people uh, are not just extrapolating price increases and buying in because they expect more, but they actually feel a positive excitement, a sort of gambler's excitement, mm -hmm. which is contagious. A bubble is something like an epidemic, but it's not a disease epidemic. It's a social epidemic that goes on for some time, but it can't go on forever. And eventually it has to stop because demand gets huge only because people think that prices will keep going up. But they can't keep going up forever. And when they stop, then they have the risk of falling and the bubble bursts. And, and is uh, of, the, of the bubbles that you've studied over the uh, you know, econ historical bubbles, um, are there some that have proven especially um, interesting and um, relevant, perhaps? Uh, today? Well, the recent bubbles, there's two of them. Well, th th there's the stock market bubbles. Mm -hmm. There's more than one recently. And there's housing market bubbles. We, we had a huge boom in the stock market in the late 1990s. It peaked in 2000. Then it went up. It bottomed out in 2003. Then it went up again until 2007. And then it crashed, bottomed out in 2009, and it's been going up. These are like consecutive bubbles, I would say. Mm -hmm. And in the housing market, starting in around the late 1990s until 2006. Now, we can go back and find earlier examples. Uh, 1929 is the most famous of them. Uh, 
But uh, I don't know, maybe the most recent example is the most important. And actually, those recent examples in the 2000s have resurrected the word bubble. Mm -hmm. People weren't even using the word very much until just after 2000. Now it's respectable. It used to be that people said, oh, you know, uh, scientific research in finance have proved that markets are efficient and there are no bubbles. Yeah, I mean, your, your fellow Nobel winner this year, Eugene Fama from the University of Chicago, uh, I, th I think I've read uh, or heard him say that um, he doesn't know what a bubble is. Yeah. Um, and uh, I assume you've had this conversation with him a number of times right. in various, <laughs> various venues. Um, but I if I may, I'm going to take a question uh, uh, from a viewer now um, on, on the same topic. Uh, so Yoon Sim uh, writes to ask, um, you recently warned that speculative, you being you, Bob Schiller, mm -hmm. recently warned speculative bubbles were emerging in the housing sector in different parts of the world, right. especially in Brazil. Right. <coughs> and asks, you know, if there are particular actions that Brazilian policymakers should take at this point, and more broadly, uh, what would be the implications for other emerging markets if, if they don't do anything? There isn't a science to controlling bubbles. Yeah. It's a little bit like, con you know, there's a mental illness called manic depressive psychosis. And we now know that lithium works as a drug, but we don't have, and it works imperfectly in that case. We don't have drugs like that for uh, speculative bubbles. And it, we're, we're reliant on therapy of a more <laughs> basic sort. There's many things that governments have been doing to limit bubbles. They can put limits on loan on the amount of loans that are given out by banks. They can uh, put restrictions against buying a second home. Uh, and, and you know, our own Dodd-Frank Act in 2010 uh, created some measures that will help prevent bubbles. But uh, again, you never know when these things are adequate uh, because the, the bubble phenomenon is essentially psychological. And, uh, you know, it's like trying to cr control a crowd. If you have an angry mob outside your door, <laughs> what scientific method can I use to control them? Well, there really isn't any. You can try to talk to them, and maybe it will work. <laughs> maybe it won't. You mentioned um, inequality earlier in, the, uh, in our chat, and it's, it's, it's a question that's much in the news. It sounds like it's um, a topic that's on your own mind a fair amount. I'm going to take a question from uh, Dale, uh, Gail Dreyfus, who writes to ask, if the excess wealth of the top 1% of Americans were distributed more equally, would it make a significant difference to everyone else? Or would everyone receive such a small share that it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference at all? Well, that's a good uh, question. The total wealth of the household sector in the United States is something like $50 trillion. I don't have the latest mm -hmm. value. Divide that by 300 million. Uh, I can't do that in my head, but uh, it's enough to, yeah, if they were to completely average that out, it would be enough to, you know, provide a house for every individual. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of money. But it's not super a lot <laughs> in the sense that mm. uh, the average, the median household already has something like $50,000 a year income. It doesn't compare with that. Uh, the other thought about redistributing all of this wealth after the fact, that means after people, some people have spent their lifetimes earning it, and some people have been diligent in saving. There's a real problem with that. I don't think we can do that. We have to make adjustments that go f forward and respect what people have already done. Now, I know that there's anger about some people who, who have made huge fortunes out of uh, business dealings that really weren't productive and helpful to society. But we do live in a country with a rule of law, and you don't just take something away from someone mm -hmm. who made the money legally. But th that said, I think that we as a nation going forward should think about what kind of incentives we create, what kind of opportunities we allow for uh, amassing wealth. And uh, I think the focus should be on the future. Mm. I mean, implicit in that question uh, from Gail um, is, is, is the question, well, does it really matter? If it, if it doesn't, if it wouldn't redistribute, 
um, if, if it wouldn't affect the lives of everyone else in a, a significant way, in what sense does it actually matter that there's this great inequality? And obviously, there's uh, uh, an important, uh, perhaps primary moral dimension to it, but I don't know if you have. Yeah. Uh, there is a moral dimension to it that some people are struggling to get by. Uh, and uh, that changes the whole feeling in our society. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are a nation, we have a sense of community, and we have to, uh, we care about each other. I, I, I think that even for the richest people, they don't want to see a society where there are starving children on the street. Uh, they <laughs> we don't want that. I wouldn't want that. I don't think that anyone wants that. So there has to be some sharing. Now, one element of sharing is philanthropy. And one thing that we're seeing, for example, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have a so-called giving pledge campaign. They're trying to encourage wealthy people to give their wealth mm -hmm. to charity or to philanthropy. Um, and that's, that's part of the pro I wish it were a little bit stronger than it is, but that's part of the process. Of it's not all the government that r would help restore it. it. It ultimately belongs to the people because the people elect their government, and they also take own their own personal measures to help alleviate poverty. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you've said that um, that it is a moral obligation of the rich to give away money. Do yeah. I have that right? Right. I, I am actually chiming in with Andrew Carnegie, who wrote a book over a hundred years ago yeah. called The Gospel of Wealth. <laughs> and what is the gospel of wealth? It's exactly what you said. It's all right to make a lot of money, but before you die, you should give most of it away constructively back to humanity. And I th uh, that's what I've asked my students to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was even thinking of having them sign a pledge in class, but then I decided that's being a little too heavy-handed. <laughs> so I didn't, but I tell them that, that uh, it doesn't make any sense to amass a billion dollars and then just, wh what are you going to do with a billion? There's nothing. You can only drive one car at a time. You can only live in one house at a time. If you've got 20 houses, that's kind of silly, right? Because you're only consuming one twentieth. And uh, it's really, really better if one gives back to society. So now, you can do that, incidentally. I tell my students, you are under no obligation to make money. You can give back to society by taking some very low-paying job. And I think that's just as noble as what I mentioned Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are doing. So. Um, um do, do you think that there's sort of, have you ever imagined a number, uh, a percentage that, that you would imagine as the, the sort of morally um, just what amount? What percent to give away? Yeah. Well, the Bible and the Quran and other religious texts say 10% of your income every year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Buffett and Gates said 50% of your accumulated wealth. Mm. Uh, so I haven't tried to give another number. Uh, I, I'm impressed with anyone who gives away 50% <laughs> of their <laughs> wealth on, re on retirement. I'm going to take another question on, uh, on inequality, and this is from Randy, who asks, why has income equality uh, increased after both the dot-com and housing bubbles? Shouldn't bubbles have a larger impact on those with more invested? Uh, that's an interesting point. So uh, I'm not sure it has uh, the larger impact on, <laughs> on, mm. on uh, people who, who are more invested uh, because they're, they are often, they have good advice and they hedge mm -hmm. risks and protect themselves. A lot of the inequality that we speak of is income inequality, not wealth inequality. There's a distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the inequality that we see is at the top 1% or the top 10th of 1%. It seems like our modern economy is producing opportunities for people in business to make huge sums of money. Uh, and uh, th that's, that's w and, and it's, pr it's partly because of uh, information technology. It's partly because of globalization. So you can take a business that's making a little bit of money, 
fire the workers in America, transfer your production to China, do some <laughs> operations like that, and you can make huge amounts of money. I'm not even saying that's a bad thing to do, I guess. It hurts Americans, it helps Chinese. But, but the point is that it makes you, the manager, really wealthy. Uh, I mean, I t I've been teaching finance at Yale to undergraduates for 25 years, and I tell them that finance is a very powerful technology. That's, I think, why so many of the richest people involve themselves in it, at least partially. But you have a moral obligation as someone who's, who's uh, acquired those skills to give back to society in one way or another. You uh, spoke of your uh, students uh, a few moments ago, and, and, and of course the course that you've been teaching for a long time uh, here at Yale. You're about to bring that to a much larger audience than you've ever been able to, to do before. Uh, when you start later this month uh, teaching a Coursera course, a massive open online course on financial markets. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the course uh, that you've been teaching, or a course that you've been teaching at Yale for, I don't know, two decades or something right. like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about why, um, of all the courses you've taught over the years, that's the one that you wanted to um, start with. Well, I think, I like uh, finance. Well, Yale is not strong on vocational studies. We don't teach shorthand. We don't teach massage therapy. We don't teach social work. Not as a you know, not as preparing you for a job. But I think people do have to think about what they can do. And uh, many of our students will later go into a graduate program to learn some of those skills that I mentioned. But I think that uh, my course is it's a mixture of uh, learning about the world and also learning useful skills. Uh, I believe, I don't have any statistics, I believe that my students who take this course are very successful on the job market and they move into important positions. So I'm proud of my list of, an, of alumni, but it's not me, it's the technology. Finance is a technology for getting things done. It's about financing. Some people think it's about making money. I don't, well, maybe that's part of it, but I think of it instead as financing activities. Mm -hmm. Our society, our civilization, is built on organizations more than on individual people. Just about everybody belongs to some kind of organization, usually a company, and that company exists only according to the rules of finance. That's why finance is so central. It's about creating organizations that fulfill purposes, long-lived organizations. People come and go within the organization. The organization lives on because it has a financial structure that defines it. I think that knowing this technology is really important, not just for people who want to specialize in finance, but to anyone who wants to have influence on our society, who wants to do something that makes a mark on our society, you have to appreciate finance because it is how we get big things done. Now, uh, as I understand it, there's something like 100,000 people who've already registered for mm -hmm. the course, which I believe starts February 17. Is right. That, that, um, other than the mode of delivery, um, will these uh, people have um, uh, an experience that, um, at least from a content perspective, is very similar to the course that you teach you know, in person here at Yale? Well, we followed Coursera guidelines. Yeah. The course is a little bit shorter. It's divided up into shorter segments. Not I have these hour and 15 minute lectures here, so we divided it up into something more like 20 minutes per lecture. Uh, and I, I've tried to make it more um, punchy, and it, it's shorter. 13. It's eight weeks rather than 13. Also, I I think that I'm th I'm thinking that I want to focus in more precisely on the skills that you will get and mm. the understanding you'll get. Uh, I'm a, a little bit less discursive <laughs> in, mm -hmm. the, in this new version. I'm hoping that it will be like a college finance course that teaches the basics, but I don't want to lose sight of the moral values and the, um, the, the sense of purpose. Cause I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, people need a sense of how they fit into society, mm. why what I'm doing is good. 
And I think that in the, in the area of finance, there is a bit of a challenge because finance offers opportunities for sleazy behavior. <laughs> and we have to warn people about that. And while they're studying, it's the time to discuss those issues and it's a time to stiffen oneself against the temptations. I'm going to take another question. Uh, this one has to do with Africa. Uh, this is from Leslie Bull, who writes to ask, some have argued that Africa's recent economic boom is a short-term development brought on by rising commodity prices that will inevitably fall, while others see it as a signal of a new era of growth for the continent. Where do you fall in this debate, and what do you predict for Africa's economic future? Well, I believe that there is something fundamentally important going on in Africa, as it is in the emerging world. If you look at data on GDP growth, it's really all regions of the world that have shown growth, substantial growth in recent decades. It's, it's not a sudden, short-lived phenomenon. It's it's a long-lasting phenomenon, and it's not confined to the oil-rich countries. Mm. I believe that it's more due to a spirit that's a, and, a, and a knowledge that is spreading around the world. The world is more built around financial capitalism than ever before. We're opening up stock markets <laughs> all over the world. Venture capital firms are starting to practice in countries where such a thing was unheard of. Entrepreneurship is being encouraged. Young people all over the world, in every country of the world, are interested in becoming entrepreneurs. And there's an uh, understanding today that entrepreneurship is where economic growth begins. You see this in Africa. You will see this in the M Middle East, in Latin America, Asia. Uh, all of the emerging world is to, to varying extents, but to a substantial extent, participating in what I think historians will someday describe as a historically important transition. So it's, it's much broader than commodities. That's correct. And even those commodity-rich countries that are running out of oil these days are actually, many of them, starting sovereign wealth funds because they're aware that they're going to run out of oil. And so instead of just consuming all the oil, uh, uh, they are investing for the future, which is, a, which is a quite an uh, a increased step forward in enlightenment that we've seen over the last decade or two. It's, it's, it's a growing phenomenon that people are appreciating that you have to lock down, secure the wealth, and not go through it fast. That's part of finance. I'm going to take a question from Ed Hamilton, who writes uh, to say and then ask, uh, inflation-adjusted price histories of stocks and homes show bubbles very well, he writes, but these histories are seldom shown to the people. Uh, do you think these histories are too technical uh, um, to deter bubble behavior by people? Well, I think bubble behavior is here to stay. <laughs> so yeah. showing a plot of data is helpful, but uh, most people will not be deterred by it. The problem is that bubble behavior, and this gets back to my, you mentioned my dispute with Eugene Fama at the Nobel event. Uh, bubbles are kind of hard to understand. Uh, it, it's, it's a phenomenon that, uh, confuses people, even, in, uh, even people who try very hard. The, the word bubble suggests that prices will build for a while and then suddenly burst, and then it's done, it's gone. But the world is constantly surprising us. And you, you may see a, what seems to be the end of a bubble, and then surprisingly it, it starts growing up again. And so people don't know what to make of it. That's why they don't seem to learn lessons. After the collapse of the housing bubble in 2006, well, it went from 2006 to 2012 in the United States. You might think that people learned their lesson. But no, <laughs> the lesson that many of them learned is it's going to start all over again. <laughs> I this is a t time when its prices are low. I better get into it. That's the so, so I don't think that we um, have learned. And, and um, we're, we're probably vulnerable to bubbles 
going. And I think probably even more vulnerable to bubbles now in the information age when we have internet and communications and uh, Twitter, minute by minute communications. And, and when we have a sense of anxiety over financial capitalism and the rising inequality within it, you get more and more people who worry about bubbles. And that worry can be a self-fulfilling prophecy and it can create those same bubbles. I mean, to the, to the extent that humans remain human, we're always going to be subject to animal spirits. Um, right. and, and so I guess a, a question is, is, is there any way to, to subdue um, the, the less rational aspects of our, our nature, uh, you know, to advance uh, greater economic well-being for a greater number of people? Well, I've written books about this. <laughs> and, and not only that, there is an emerging group in finance and economics uh, who are studying behavioral economics which brings in human nature to the uh, a better understanding of human nature into the analysis. And it's not just in economics departments. People in other social sciences are getting interested. We have neuroscience now. In the medical school, we have people who are studying. They put people in fMRI machines and study the brain patterns when they're making financial decisions. Uh, and so I think that we're moving forward. We're understanding things better and we can make better policies, and we can create opportunities for people to protect themselves from mm -hmm. bubbles in a better way. Question from Vladimir Glinka, who asks, and this is somewhat of a technical question, uh, it appears to me, what is the difference between feedback theory and herd behavior? Okay. Uh, feedback, they're both elements of my theory mm -hmm. of, of bubbles. Feedback is price increases get people excited, and they buy and push the price up again, getting more people excited. And, uh, that's feedback. Herd behavior refers to a human tendency to follow others. Now, uh, you might call that something like, I can see why he phrased that mm -hmm. question, but herd behavior has a more of a psychological element to it. It's something about how we judge the truth. It's often very difficult to know I'm only one person, I can't figure everything else out. I take for granted that what other people are saying is true. And I might even feel some emotional pull. Uh, I want to be liked. Uh, uh, other people are saying certain things, so I'll say them too. That's herd behavior. And they're both elements of a properly constructed theory of bubbles. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you know Janet Yellen, uh, the incoming um, chair of the Federal Reserve. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've been asked this before. Maybe she's asked you this question before. Yeah. But do you have any advice for her as she, uh, <laughs> she ascends to the job? Well, I, I trust her judgment very well. And yeah, I've talked to her. Uh, I think that we narrowly missed another Great Depression this time around. And uh, we need to use policies that recognize the instability of the economy. There's wishful thinking that an unregulated economy would be stable. Well, we know that in the past, in the 19th century, b before there was much regulation, uh, the economy was very unstable. Uh, and uh, we're learning, and we ought to be able to. I think that what uh, Ben Bernanke did on his watch was uh, very helpful in reducing the amplitude of fluctuations. I think of her as similar to Bernanke, who will use good judgment. Now, she is inheriting a difficult situation where aggressive monetary policy has already been tried. Uh, and the, the Fed balance sheet, the Federal Reserve System balance sheet, is up to something like $4 trillion. So sh she's a little bit constrained. She has problems th uh, that are the legacy of this of this crisis. But I think she'll use good judgment in going. It's, it's a matter of keeping up, and I know that she will do this, keeping up with the news and the information as it evolves. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure she'll do that uh, well. Uh, I uh, imagine you watched or read about the President's State of Union speech the other night. There was a, a fair amount of emphasis on uh, economics. Um, one of uh, President Obama's uh, 
key goals it seems to be is to is to raise the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't wonder if you have any thoughts on on the minimum wage itself as a tool for in some way um, mitigating the um, inequality and problem. I think one of the things that recommends the minimum wage the most is just that it is apparently politically acceptable. Uh, it uh, it's probably not the ideal way to deal with inequality. First of all, it doesn't discriminate among different, it's teenagers who are the people who are paid below the minimum wage the most, and they're not typically worrying right. about uh, families. Uh, it has a possibility of causing layoffs. It, 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 in one sense, what you're doing is telling employers, we're going to tax you, uh, we're going to make you pay, instead of making all mm -hmm. of society pay. Uh, but I think that within limits, uh, a minimum wage may be a good policy. It's fallen behind. It used to be. It hasn't kept up with inflation, mm. um, and maybe they should index it to inflation. Uh, but on top of that, I think that maybe some other policies. Uh, Edmund Phelps is an economist, a, a Nobel Prize-winning economist, has recommended that the government subsidize low-income employment, and mm. this would mean that all the burden isn't being visited on the people who are already employing low-income people, but it would be spread out among society. And it could be uh, more finely tuned than, uh, than the uh, minimum wage is now. Uh, I have other proposals in my book that- um, Which book? Well, various books, not, not this one. I had one called New Financial Order uh, in 2003, and then Subprime Solution in 2008. Uh, in these books, I argued that we should make a plan for the distant future about what we're going to do if inequality gets much worse. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately the minimum wage is not going to do the trick. Mm. We need to uh, have a policy that is conditionally redistributed. And I have to make this clear because some people are so negative about redistribution. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have substantial inequality I'm because it's an incentive. It incentivizes people. If we can't have complete equality because then no one would work hard because what's the point, you know? And if I make money, it'll be taken away from. It has to be just. It has to respect people who've made money. But I'm worried that inequality is going to get much worse in the future. I don't know that it will. Mm. I'm worried already. Young people today in my class will ask me, what career is safe going forward? And I don't know. I don't think anyone knows because information technology is automating such a high fraction of our activities uh, that it's really hard to say. And so I think we need a plan uh, as a nation and internationally because if one nation makes a plan, it's going to have a problem if it's independent of other nations because rich people will leave. Uh, that's what we saw when President Hollande in, in France raised the tax on people with incomes over a million euros to 75%. Now we're seeing rich people leaving France. That's when Gerard Depardieu went to, was it Russia went or to Belgium? Russia. Yeah. Well, I, last time I heard it was Russia. <laughs> Maybe it'll be Belgium. Uh, they'll follow the best offer. But it, it, it's a problem. That it's a difficult problem, just like global warming is a difficult problem because it's a worldwide problem. We're seeing inequality growing in most countries of the world. But I think we have to start talking now. And the talk shouldn't be focused so much on redressing past inequality. We have to think about the future and where, where we're going. So is there, is there a particular um, initiative that, that you consider this point most worth pursuing uh, as a way to mitigate rising inequality? Well, I should say the president had other proposals that he didn't explain well in his uh, State of the Union address. There was a, uh, what's it called, MIRA, uh, a new mm -hmm. uh, savings mm -hmm. incentive program that uh, the details have yet to come out. I'm impressed that he's thinking about well, a good source of our inequality, especially wealth inequality, is that many people don't save. Uh, and so a program that incentivizes them to save more sounds uh, very valuable. He also talked about pre-K uh, education. Uh, the research of Ed Ziegler here at Yale and others have shown that education of 
children, uh, of toddlers or, or young children before kindergarten can make a difference. Uh, and uh, there were other ideas, I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, that might, in the president's speech, that might uh, reflect on any, well, he also talked about his innovation institutes. Uh, I don't know if he used that word this time, but he has set up a um, institute in Youngstown, Ohio, to try to create high-tech jobs there. Uh, this is an experiment that the president is behind, and I'm not sure that it's working well yet, but uh, it, uh, we do have to think about jobs and how we'll create jobs and how we'll create jobs in meaningfully growing sectors. You are so well known for your uh, analysis of the housing market. I would be remiss not to ask you your thoughts about housing in um, let's focus on the United States uh, right now. Well, I have my own home price indices, the Standard & Poor Case Shiller Home Price Index, uh, and we just came out with our new numbers. So home prices nationally went up 13.7 percent over the last year. That is quite a strong rate of price increase. And the uh, question is, what is the outlook for that? Well, w w we have learned, Carl Case and I, mm -hmm. my colleague, and now other research has confirmed that home prices show a lot of momentum. They go in the same direction month after month, maybe year after year. So with home prices going up so fast, I think uh, – now the latest month, uh, in November, is down, but that's because of the, the, the season. It's, uh, the, it's not the peak season. So I don't think that means anything. I think basically on a seasonally adjusted basis, home prices are going up rapidly and they will likely continue to go up. On the other hand, <laughs> I think that I wouldn't extrapolate another year of 13.7 percent home price increases. It's not going to be that fast, I don't think, partly because we're entering the tapering, which Janet Yellen, mm -hmm. I think, will continue with. That means that mortgage rates might go up. They're not going to go down or less likely to go down. That's going to deter home buyers. Uh, and uh, there, there's some signs of a weakening world economy as well. Mm. Uh, so I, don't, I just – the other thing is I don't think that we're in so strong a bubble mentality as we were in, say, 2003, 2004. I've been doing questionnaire survey studies of, of home buyer behavior, and I don't see it. It's not uh, – so I, that's my, my guess. Home prices will keep going up, but maybe at 5% over the next year. Uh, not sure exactly. No one knows. But, but so that means that people probably shouldn't and it shouldn't consider it urgent to buy in. I mean, 5 percent is 5 percent, you know, on a $200,000 house, that's $10,000. But, you know, you could put your money in some other investment and you might make more. So I don't think people should rush to buy into a housing market. If they're ready and they want to, great. But not to get spooked by this so-called bubble right now. I'm going to take a question from uh, Kanadu Oduru, who asks, given available alternatives, is gold the most reliable and stable product to invest in? Well, I don't think reliable and stable is the words I would use. The gold has done very well in the first uh, decade of the 21st century because economic anxiety has been growing and people often flock to gold when anxiety grows. But it's very volatile and uh, uh, I'm not uh, – uh, I, I don't know how to predict what it's going to do. The uh, economy might be healing and, and the whole gold prices might fall dramatically. Tell us briefly uh, a little bit about the, uh, the Nobel uh, experience uh, that you had uh, when you went to receive the award. Well, there's a week-long Nobel week, and it was, it was actually a lot of fun. It was exhausting. <laughs> I, no rest, uh, but uh, it, uh, I got to meet other Nobelists, including Jim Rothman here at the Yale Medical Had you ever School. met him before? I hadn't met him, no, not before I won the uh, – we, we, <laughs> we won the prize. But uh, it was fun. I had the opportunity to talk with all these different Nobelists. 
Um, except Alice Munro, the literature one was ill and couldn't come, but every other one I met, and it was that was great. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to wrap this up pretty soon. I'm going to take a, a question from uh, Nicholas Pujol, who asks, um, with a developed world in so much debt relative to GDP, uh, isn't hyperinflation the only way out? I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I think my uh, sense is that we're under control about it. Uh, the government has issued a lot of high-powered money or reserves, but they've kept it in so that the money supply actually hasn't gone up more than historically. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve pays interest on reserves, which causes member banks to prevent them if, from lending it out and, and increasing the money supply. So it seems to be under control. Ben Bernanke has said that there's no cause for alarm, and I, I, I think that's right. I, I'm not alarmed about hyperinflation, but there, there is a, there are bad scenarios that might be troublesome. The Fed has bought a lot of mortgage securities, and it's on its balance sheet. If the uh, economy collapses again, uh, those mortgage securities might not have good prices, and so the, the Fed would then be technically insolvent, and we might have to, in effect, bail out the Fed, or they could have to, it would have to bail itself out by printing money. But I don't think that will happen. I think uh, it'll probably be all right. So you're starting the Coursera course on the uh, 17th. Um, I believe you, you recently published Finance in the Good Society, right? right. A book that will, it, it will be used in that course, I think, right? Or parts it's a book that I'm going to refer to because it's a, it's a book that I wrote in a conjunction with this course as a way of thinking about the, what's really on so many people's minds is what does it all mean? And uh, are people in finance good people or not? Well, uh, th there is no single answer to that. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. I want my students to be the good, the good ones, and I want to see them as contributing to society. On that note, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us to chat today, and I want to thank all of you for watching At Yale Live and hope that you'll join us again next time.